come on, it's not September yet. We've got this in us now today. We've got eye-watering energy bills. Why do so many people want to leave Albania to come here? And Urban Foxes driving us mad. Let me know what you think about all of the above on GBviews at gbnews.uk. Get typing while you watch the latest news. Good morning, it's just gone 10 o'clock. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Breaking news in the last half an hour, a 36-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell in Liverpool. The nine-year-old was shot in her home on Monday night after a gunman chased another man into her home in the Dovecot area of the city. Merseyside Police says the suspect, who's from Heaton, was arrested during an operation involving armed officers. Energy bills will rise by more than 80% from October, hitting households already struggling through the cost of living crisis. Ofgem has announced the price cap will increase from just under £2,000 to over £3,500 from October. The Chancellor, Nadim Zahawi, acknowledges the rise will cause stress for many, but says government help is coming. Those who are already tightening their belts fear there's worse to come. You know, I'm lucky enough that this next price cap rise might not mean we can't buy food, but it's a pattern that means that things become more difficult for us and maybe if it happens again, we're in trouble. It is hard. And the only, way, uh, only solution I've got at the moment is um, possibly moving in one of my um, uh, kids, uh, their wife and, the two, uh, and the, uh, two of my grandchildren, so I can make ends meet. There's definitely been a massive increase in, in the supermarkets. I mean, I shop in there, in, in, in some super, in, in, even in the budget supermarkets like Lidl's, Aldi. The prices have changed dramatically in, in the sort of like the last sort of three to six months. What I'm definitely doing is you spend what's on what's important. What you don't need to do, you don't do it and try and budget as much as possible. Well, Energy and Utilities Alliance CEO Mike Foster says the government needs to offer long-term support rather than temporary solutions. This is something that households are you know, really going to worry about until the government decide exactly what type of support it's going to give. Um, it needs a bazooka, not a pea shooter now. We're, we're, we can't just tinker at the edges. The sort of increase that we've seen, you know, nearly £1,600 increase in, a, in a, a typical or average household bill uh, is too much to bear. A GB News People's Poll has found the majority of Brits prefer a Labour government with Sir Keir Starmer at the helm rather than a Conservative one under Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. The survey shows Labour holds a 14% lead over the Tories. The findings conducted by People Polling also reveals the word that comes to mind the most about Tory leadership frontrunner Liz Truss is untrustworthy. Professor of Politics at University of Kent, Matthew Goodwin, says it could mean the Conservatives will have less support at the next election. There is a risk here, uh, clearly in these numbers, that if, if things don't change, uh, the Conservatives are looking at a sort of 1997-2001 scenario where they not only lose that all-important red wall in Northern England, but they also lose a large chunk of that blue wall across the south. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has accused Russia of nearly causing a radiation disaster at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. It's after the Zaporizhia facility was temporarily cut off from Ukraine's power grid. President Zelensky's blamed shelling by Russian forces, allegations Moscow denies. He said it was only due to backup electricity kicking in that the plant was able to operate safely. And President Zelensky's praised the Ukrainian technicians at the plant. And more than 100,000 Royal Mail workers have walked off the job in a dispute over pay. It's the first of four days of industrial action, with strikes also taking place on the 31st, as well as next month on the 8th and 9th. The Communication Workers' Union says it's the biggest strike in the UK since 2009. It's demanding a pay rise that more closely reflects the current rate of inflation. Royal Mail has warned letters won't be delivered and some parcels will be delayed. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens. Now it's back to Bev with To The Point.
Thank you, Rhiannon. Good morning. Thank you for joining me, Bev Turner, here on GB News TV Radio and online. It is finally Friday, so stick around to find out all you need to know. First up, average households in Britain are set to pay an extra 1,600 quid in their annual energy bills from the 1st of October. After Ofgem raised the energy cap this morning to over £3,500, I'll be working out what all that means and asking if it is time to renationalise. It turns out that most of the so-called asylum seekers crossing the channel to the UK are actually from Albania. So why are these people leaving Albania for the UK and what is our government going to do to stop it? I'm going to investigate that a little later. And finally, I'll be debating whether foxes are friends or foes after videos have gone viral of people both feeding these wild animals and some being attacked by them. A representative from the animal welfare movement and a firearms dealer will be joining me for this debate. You won't want to miss that. I've got all of that coming up and much more across the programme. Get in touch with your views as usual. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Right, as I just said there, energy regulator Ofcom announced this morning that they're going to raise the energy price cap from 1971 to 3,549 from the 1st of October. This means that the average household using a typical amount of electricity and gas will pay around £1,600 more a year in bills or £130 a month than we did before. That's not all. The price cap will be changed in three months' time, with economists predicting it'll be even higher. Analysts say that bills could peak at well over £5,000 a year next year. I sort of get this, but I sort of don't, Liam Halligan. <laughs> what is a price cap and why does it seem to be anything but a cap? The cap is what Ofgem, the energy regulator, allows companies that sell you and I gas and electricity to charge us per unit. Right. And this is a cap on the u per unit cost. And then the, the, the numbers you just read out, they are what that cap on the per unit cost would mean for the average household. So if you've got a big household or if you're, you use lots of electrical equipment, mm. for instance, a lot of uh, GB News viewers and listeners with disabilities will use yeah. a lot of electrical equipment, then your bills are likely to be much, much higher. And it's a cap because if the cap wasn't there, wholesale energy prices are so high that our bills would be even higher. OK. So these people are, are look, they're even looking after us with these prices. That's what you say. Th that's it. If the cap wasn't there, because look, wholesale energy... Look, the cap is up 80% this year, right? right. Incre from 1277 to about three and a half grand, as you just said. If, but wholesale energy prices are up 45% in August alone, mm. not least because of the war in Ukraine. Energy markets were already, you know, toppy yeah. in December and January, but they got, they've gone nuts since, so of course, got, the war so in you've Ukraine. you've got the people who get the oil and gas out of yeah, the ground, they are right? the energy... This is Shell, they are, yeah, BP, yeah, those big yeah, companies. Absolutely. They are, they are making huge amounts of money because their extraction costs are pretty much the same, and yet the price at which they can sell that oil and gas is much, much higher. Because Partic the supply is down. Yeah, partic particularly gas, and demand's going through the roof. Oil's slightly come off, but... Right. Yeah, that's why the government has already announced a windfall tax on those companies that are operating in the North Sea. And then they sell it to the likes of EDF and all the people that we... They, they then sell it to the, the customer-facing energy companies. Right. You know, the, the, the companies that the name, the name at the on top your of your bill. And none of them are making a profit... Good. ..at all. <laughs> I mean, 20, 29, 30 of them have, have closed down. They're bankrupt. That's not so good. Yeah, indeed. And then, and then government has to pay for their customers to be taken on by other companies. So the cap is there to stop the energy companies, the customer-facing energy suppliers, right. not the energy giants, to stop making excessive profits. But at the moment, they're making no profits. Mm. And that is the problem because those wholesale energy prices are so high, not least because of the war in Ukraine. God. So it's not a nice message for a, Liam? It's not a nice message for a Friday, but, you know, we've been talking about this for months. This price, energy price cap, when I, I listened to it in the shower this morning, yeah. I was shocked but not surprised. You turned the temperature down on your shower. <laughs> I, do. I am, I am. I'm having cold, cold showers, showers, darling, cold or... showers. <laughs> it is, it's just... It's we knew very... this was coming for ages and it's absolutely... You know, it's it's very hard to defend the fact 
that we've allowed this energy price cap to be announced now, yeah. so everybody has it in their face, mm -hmm. you know, on the telly and the radio. They're wondering, I can't pay these bills, this is ridiculous. How can I feed my family? The government should have something in place now so people like me and you can report to people at home and listening in their cars yeah. and at work, but it's OK, this is what's going to happen. It's going to hurt, but here are the mitigating circumstances. Here is how your government is going to look after you. But because the Tories have had this, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks of political pantomime, they keep telling us, oh, we've got to wait for the energy price cap. This energy price cap is within 50 quid of what people like me have been saying for months because it's based on wholesale energy prices that we've already seen. And you can read those in the financial markets every day. Mm -hmm. All right, Liam, thank you. I really wish you hadn't told me about you in the shower now. I'm going to struggle to get that image out of my head now for the rest of it. But if you want to see more of Liam, not that much, he's going to be back on at 1 o'clock this afternoon on GB News with his show On The Money, which should be a must-watch if you want to know how to make the most of the pounds in your pocket. Uh, now, uh, UK gas prices have hit the highest levels in five months. That's not a surprise what we've just been talking about. Jumping by 82 pence to £5.80 per therm. Our South West of England reporter Jeff Moody is at a pub in Hampshire right now to see how they're reacting to the news of energy price rises. Good morning, uh, Jeff. What's the mood like at the White Horse Inn today? This is going to hit businesses really hard. It really is. It really is. And, and to such an extent that the landlord and the landlady here have decided that enough is enough. They, they cannot continue under these conditions. Let's have a quick chat to them to find out why they've reached such a difficult decision. Uh, hello, guys. Um, Shaker, why have you decided that, that you can't carry on anymore? I mean, since you, everyone knows that the hospitality industry has been suffering for since COVID hit and uh, we were trying to slowly trying to get a grip on the the losses which we have cured and um, now the situation is totally out of control the prices have gone as i said earlier double the and there is not there's a dip in the sales as well from where we are and location wise we we tried a different side of the uh, angles to try to absorb the cost but end result is it's very hard at the moment and it's not the same like we were we were getting a few support from the government side but now it's it's out of our control it's out of our hands and we we can't absorb any more uh you know risk wise it's huge because we are a family business we can't go bust in you know longer run it's not easy to carry on like this alex how does that feel for you because anybody that works in the hospitality industry puts their heart and soul into it not to mention the long hours how does it feel we're just so disappointed just because of what you just said as well. We invested so much. We put our heart and soul into this business. We've done everything we can in our power. We, we just made it so much different from what it used to be. Uh, we improved on so many levels. And then at the end result, we are just we, we can't sustain anymore and just we are so disappointed and heartbroken. We, this is our home. This is our lives. And leaving this behind and leaving this community which has been a family for us and we hope we've been a family for them uh, is so sad and we feel so bad. Well, I mean, it certainly is a, a great community pub. I mean, the, the, the White Horse here is, is known right across Hampshire and, and people come from, from further afield. People come from as far away as Bognor just to come here because of the offering. But no more. And it, it's a story that is uh, being told right across the country. They are saying that seven out of ten pubs will struggle to survive this winter. Back to you. That's just so bleak. Honestly, um, thanks, Jeff. Um, what can I say? You know, it, it's so hard for hospitality. We were talking about it yesterday. Um, but also for, for all of us. So what options do people have to keep uh, bills down and here to explain more is uh, John Bosco, Wog John Bosco Wogbo, lead campaigner at We Own It, a public ownership campaign group opposed to privatisation. John Bosco, it's, it's lovely to see you again. Um, I thought it was really interesting the last time you spoke to me because it does cause us to reflect at a time like this on whether renationalisation is a good idea of these companies. Why do you think it would be and how would it work? So I just wanted to start by essentially kind of re-highlighting what you did a brilliant job there of doing of who is at the sharp edge of this crisis, right? So we like to talk about 
the grandma and the grandpa that will be affected or the single mothers who will um, be affected by this problem and they will seriously be hit by it. But it's also important to remember the small businesses that will be hit by this. I was listening to a story yesterday of a kebab shop that has five members of staff and they've had to fire all five members of staff and bring in family members who will do the job for free. Otherwise, they would have to close up. So this is a desperate crisis and the government doesn't need to nibble at the edges anymore. It needs to take a bazooka to this problem and deal with it. And as we have um, said before, obviously, the government needs to immediately cap energy bills and not just kind of the cap that we saw today. It needs to take it back to where it was a year ago and kind of support families with funding. That's what it should do today. But from tomorrow, I think the government needs to take seriously the problems, the fundamental problems with the energy system that is causing this problem in the first place. Your viewers need to ask themselves, why is it that while there is a global energy um, crisis or price spiral, people in France are paying just 4% more for energy, for their household energy than we are? They need to be asking themselves, why is it that while there's a global price um, spiral, people in Norway have their energy bills subsidized by the government than we do? The reason for that is the profit of the private companies. We saw research yesterday um, produced by um, um, Unite the Union that found that 30% of the price hikes that we are seeing actually are profits of the private um, energy companies. They found that about um, over the last year, they've made about 15 billion pounds in profits. And that, just, that is just not a way to, work, to organize a system that people depend on to live. People will die this winter if they're not able to um, get the energy they need. John Bosco, just, just remind me the situation. Is it EDF, which is owned predominantly by the French government here? And so the French government is able to take profits to give them back to the French people, but effectively those profits are, are coming from us. It sounds too crazy to be true, but it is, isn't it? It is true. Um, EDF is owned um, um, almost entirely by the French government, and they're in the process of taking it into public ownership 100%. Now, it was previously 84%. Um, and yes, they are responsible for supplying, for generating and supplying energy to people in France, and they are able to use EDF in France to keep their energy bills low. But here in the United Kingdom, they are increasing people's bills every single couple of uh, months, right? So um, they are taking profits from Britain and reinvesting that profits in France to keep the bills of their people lower. And to some extent, I don't actually really blame them. The government of France is supposed to be responsible for the people of France. The, the government of Britain doesn't appear to care very much about the people of Britain. If it did, it would do what the government of, of governments like France and Norway and other countries around Europe are doing, establishing a publicly owned energy generator, distributor and supplier that is able to take profits from the generation part, which um, Neil Hargan said earlier. The generation part is where the money is take the profits from that part of the business and put it into the supply part and subsidize bills that way. Yeah, always lovely to talk to you and always illuminating. John Bosco and Wilkbo there, lead campaigner at We Own It, a public ownership campaign group. It gives you food for thought, doesn't it, as to whether we are getting it right because it looks like a lot of European countries are doing a lot better than us at the same time receiving the, the gas from the same places. Now, Merseyside police have arrested a 36-year-old man on suspicion of the murder of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell in Liverpool. Uh, for more, we can go live to Notty Ash in Liverpool with our North West reporter, Sophie Reaper. Hello, Sophie. What have we heard this morning? Hello. Well, as you say, the latest we've heard is that Merseyside police have now made an arrest of a man on suspicion of the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell. She was shot by a gunman here on Monday night as he tried to shoot a man who's now been named as 35-year-old convicted burglar, Joseph Nee. He forced his way into Olivia's home and Olivia was shot by the gunman as a result. Now, the family have obviously been devastated by her death and yesterday we heard from them in an official capacity for the first time. They put out a statement in tribute to the nine-year-old and they told people that it, they needed to do the right thing. In the statement they said 
We as a family are heartbroken and have lost a huge part of our life. If anyone knows anything, now is the time to speak up. It's not about being a snitch or a grass. It's about finding out who took our baby away from us. Now, Merseyside police have said they will do what it takes to find Olivia's killer. They'll say, they've said they will leave no stone unturned. And over the past few days, they've carried out a series of raids and arrests as part of their crackdown on serious and organised crime here in Liverpool. They say they want no more guns here in the city. Now, the community has been rocked by Olivia's death, of course, but they've also rallied together. In the last few moments, we've seen flowers delivered from the two Premier League teams here in the city of Everton and Liverpool and that's a symbol of the community coming together with Olivia's family to commemorate her life and sadly her death. Of course there are, there are currently three murder investigations going on here in Liverpool for the deaths of the three people who've been killed as a, as a result of gun crime here in the city in the last week alone. Police have been saying that they are determined though to find the killers of Sam Rimmer, Ashley Dale and of course nine-year-old schoolgirl Olivia. Olivia Pratt Corbell. Thank you, Sophie. Good job. Thanks for bringing us up to speed um, on all that. It must be a strange time to be in the city of Liverpool at the moment. Now, after the break, the UK government is working with Albania to solve the channel migrant crisis. What are they looking to do? And what do you think Albania is like? I'm going to show you some photos in a minute. I think you will be surprised. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to show you those in just a couple of minutes. Join my show, Farage, 7pm till 8pm, Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good morning, it's 10.23. It is Friday. This is To The Point with me, Bev Turner, on GB News, on your TV, online and on radio this morning. Now, it's been revealed that a 60% uh, of the migrants currently crossing the channel in small boats are from Albania, a tiny nation of less than 3 million people. An emergency agreement between the UK and Albania will come into force next week, aiming to rapidly remove those Albanians who arrive by small boat and who the government believes have no right to be here. As our Home and Security Editor Mark White reports, those Albanians who enter the UK illegally could be on a deportation flight home within just a few weeks. Arriving into Dover Harbour, the Border Force vessel Ranger, her decks packed with Channel migrants, most likely to be from Albania. In fact, we can confirm that 60% of those currently arriving into UK waters on small boats are from that tiny nation. 
In truth, this is a crisis within a crisis, which has so concerned UK authorities it resulted in what amounts to an emergency agreement between the UK and Albanian governments to rapidly remove those with no right to asylum. The British government believes that's likely to be the vast majority of those arriving from what is a peaceful nation on the Balkan Peninsula. We've been told that six in ten of those arriving on small boats at the moment are from Albania. More than 6,000 already this year and growing rapidly. Compare that to just two years ago when only 50 Albanians arrived by small boat. Here in the Albanian capital, Tirana, this is also an existential crisis for those in government here as the country faces rapid depopulation. Since the 90s, the population has fallen by more than 15% and now numbers fewer than 2.8 million people. The crisis is most acute in Albania's rural towns and villages, where the vast majority of their young have up sticks and left. In fact, Albania is one of the few nations in the world where there are more of its people living outside than inside the country. As part of the agreement with the UK, Albanian law enforcement officials will be seconded here to the border force processing centres at Dover Harbour and the former RAF base at Manston. We're told they'll help gather intelligence on arrivals and quickly assess those with no right to be here. Officials hope those individuals could be removed within two or three weeks of arriving. However, there's little doubt asylum lawyers will try to challenge those decisions. Nothing surrounding this growing crisis is ever straightforward. Mark White, GB News. So the latest official figures from the Ministry of Defence reveal that 804 migrants crossed in 16 boats yesterday alone. That is the second busiest day of the year so far. GB News analysis of the figures shows that a total of 24,196 people have now crossed since the 1st of January this year. So what can we do? Ivan Sampson is an immigration lawyer and joins me now. Good morning, Ivan. These numbers are increasingly eye-watering and seem to evade any sort of solution. What do you think we should do? Well, the powers already exist for the government to do something. In 2003, Michael Howard uh, started what's called a white list, countries that are safe to return to for asylum seekers. Um, in 2003, 1995 that was, in 2003, David Blunkett included Albania. So Albania is on the white list of safe countries. So um, anyone claiming asylum can have their asylum considered fairly quickly because there's a presumption that Albania is a safe country. On top of that, uh, the, uh, the Home Office can certify any uh, asylum claims or appeals. So if someone tries to appeal a claim, that can be certified under Section 94 on the grounds that it's clearly unfounded. Now, the problems they have is identity. So it, it's a good thing that they've got Albanian officers coming over, seconded to the UK, because they can assess somebody from their accent, from the way they look, um, fairly accurately, I would imagine, from where, whether they're from Albania or not. So they'll make those assessments, give that advice to the UK, and on the back of that advice, the UK will be entitled to then to return them to Albania. And quite rightly, Albania has agreed to this. They want to join the EU. As you know, in 2021, uh, they started negotiations to accede to the European Union. So um, it's all in Albania's interest to cooperate if they want to join the EU. We, we've had this huge increase, you heard there from Mark's figures. The number of Albanians coming here has gone up enormously recently, from what used to be quite a small uh, number. Do you know why that is? I mean, I'm going to show some photos. I said I was going to show some, some pictures of Albania. It's clearly not a wealthy company, country, but look at that. Um, it, is, it is an attractive country. It has very beautiful natural resources. I think it has about 15 uh, national parks. They're very proud of their viticulture, of wine. It's about 3,000 years old. I mean, I look at these pictures and think... Do you, why would you leave there uh, to come here, Ivan? Um, so what is it about Albania that the young, particularly the young males, 
find so um, disengaging and disenchanting? Why would they want to leave there to come to rainy old London? Well, I think it's the same reason for the North-South divide, really. I represent a number of Albanians. I, I represent a 14-year-old boy recently who's claimed asylum in the UK, and he came across on the underneath on the wheel uh, casing of a lorry holding on for his dear life for several hours to get over here at the age of 14. And I asked him the same question. I said, well, why do you come to the UK? And he gave me two reasons. One is that we get treated fairly in the UK. The French authorities yanked him out of a lorry and told him to get lost, uh, left him alone un, un, in, in the middle of the night in, in France. When he got to the UK, he was given a, a care home, a foster carer, clothes, uh, and was looked after from day one. So that's one reason. The other reason is lack of opportunity. Um, in the rural towns in Albania, uh, education is not high on a young men's list uh, of priorities. There's a very high crime rate there. There's lots of gang culture there. People who want to do well and succeed look to the UK to be educated, to get good jobs, which are just not available in Albania. But you see, I know that their wages are not so high, but their cost of living is also very low in Albania. And of course, nobody likes to hear stories of, of children being maltreated uh, by the French or anyone, frankly. 14 is incredibly young to be going through something like that. But it sounds a little bit, Ivan, like we're a soft touch and that these countries that they're coming from, the, the, the Albania itself, is a very safe country, and that has to be one of the main reasons to seek asylum, is that you are at risk of death or persecution or danger in your own country. If we did toughen up our treatment, let's say, of illegal immigrants, are you telling me that would deter them from getting on the boat in that case? I think it would. But the pull fact of Albanians is, is the number of illegal Albanians already here probably numbering in the hundreds of thousands. I mean, the estimates are that there are between half a million and a million illegal migrants in the country already unaccounted for. So as well as dealing with 600 coming across, the Home Office should deal with that lot that are here already in the UK yeah. illegally. We don't know who they are, where they come from, what their backgrounds are. They could yeah. commit crimes and we, we would never be able to trace them. So it's a much bigger problem. And the Home Office is focusing on Albania and, and that detracts from the overall incompetence of the Home Office. Mm. Um, we need a new leader in the Home Office. And of course, and of course, once they're here, then they ring their mates and go, it's brilliant here. You really want it. You want to come and join us. I mean, that's everybody wants a point of contact, right? If these people have a point of contact here, they are much more likely to arrive and know they can seek out a mate who's going to look after them. Ivan, thank you. Many really have good. job offers. Many of them have job offers before they arrive. So um, working for various Albanian builders and, and tradesmen. So there's a pull factor, but no, something needs to be done. OK, well, well done. Thank you. Ivan Sampson there, immigration lawyer. Um, interesting, isn't it? Let me know what you think. Send me your views in on the topics we've been covering so far. GBviews at gbnews.uk. But after the break, are foxes too much of a pest to be worth protecting? I'm going to debate that next with two very special guests after these news headlines. Good morning, it's 10.33. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB Newsroom. Energy bills will rise by more than 80% from October, with Ofgem announcing the price cap will increase from just under £2,000 to over £3,500. The Chancellor, Nadim Zahawi, acknowledges the rise will cause stress for many, but says government help is coming. A 36-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell in Liverpool. The nine-year-old was shot in her home on Monday night after a gunman chased another man into her home in the Dovecot area of the city. Merseyside Police says the suspect, who's from Highton, was arrested during an operation involving armed officers. The number of people crossing the English Channel in small boats this year has passed 24,000. Ministry of Defence figures show more than 800 migrants crossed in 16 small boats yesterday, the second busiest day of the year so far. That as the cost of the UK's asylum system topped £2 billion a year for the first time, following the highest number of claims in two decades. A GB News People's Poll has found the majority of Brits prefer a Labour government with Sir Keir Starmer at the helm than 
a Conservative one under Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. The survey shows Labour holds a 14% lead over the Tories. The findings conducted by People Polling also reveals the word that comes to mind the most about Tory leadership frontrunner Liz Truss is untrustworthy. More than 100,000 Royal Mail workers have walked off the job in a dispute over pay. It's the first of four days of industrial action, with strikes also taking place on the 31st as well as next month on the 8th and 9th. The Communication Workers' Union says it's the biggest strike in the UK since 2009. It's demanding a pay rise that more closely reflects the current rate of inflation. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy $1.182 and €1.182. The price of gold currently stands at £1,482.01 £1 per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News, investments that matter. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good morning. You are watching and listening to To The Point with me, Bev Turner. It is 10.38 a.m. on Friday. It's bank holiday weekend, isn't it? Fantastic. I'd forgotten that. OK, we are live on your TV, radio and online this morning. Now, how do you feel about foxes? I'm going to go to that in a minute. I do want to come to some of your views, actually, first of all. I'm sure you'll let me know how you feel about foxes in a moment. But we were talking about the energy cap at the start of the show with Liam Halligan. I mean, I use cap in the loosest term. It doesn't seem to put a cap on it at all. It just seems to be going higher and higher. But as Liam explained, if it didn't, wasn't for that cap, it would be much higher. So Bren has got in touch. The government can afford to fork out two billion a year on immigration while we all can't afford to pay for energy bills and they are living for free. I guess this is the migrants we were just discussing. Jeremy says the betrayal of Boris by his own colleagues has led to a dereliction of duty by this current embarrassment of a government. Inflation is rocketing. Bills are crippling us already with more pain to come whilst the Tories bicker. I'm not sure it was the betrayal of Boris that has led to this situation, to be honest, Jeremy. I mean, Boris was in charge while a lot of the seeds were being sown for the mess that we're in now, but I take your point. Uh, Dean has said, Greta will be well pleased with this result. I'm now reinstating our coal fireplace this year and I will burn anything that burns. Welcome back to the 70s. Um, log fires are very fashionable now. I've been thinking about getting one myself, but I bet you they're going to ban those too soon, Dean. That'll be my prediction. 
Uh, Chris says, isn't it time for the government to act? That It isn't now time. It isn't time for the government to act. That time was 10 to 20 years ago. To act by investing in a broad range of domestic energy sources, including nuclear, electricity and gas, from fracking, it is time to invest in warm clothing and candles. I couldn't agree more, Chris. Thank you for all of those at GBviews at gbnews.uk. Now, how do you feel about foxes? Um, they make a lot of noise in the middle of the night, don't they? Especially when it's uh, mating season. And um, they've been causing a bit of controversy. We've got people in the, in the media who are, are petting foxes. I think Kate Beckinsale was one actress who was seen uh, petting a... Uh, a, a wild fox, which she apparently tamed at her parents' house in, in West London. Uh, we've got Denise Lewis, was uh, not Denise Lewis, Denise Welsh from Loose Women, <laughs> not to be confused with the athlete. Uh, Denise Welsh was talking on Loose Women about the fact that a fox got into her kitchen, it attacked her dog, and so she got the local pest control people to come round and they killed the fox, and she... Uh, got a lot of stick um, for that. There was a woman uh, in New York, it's a, a film of a woman getting attacked in her garden and that fox has been destroyed. Um, but it seems people get quite upset uh, when foxes are uh, destroyed. So let's have a chat to a couple of people that might help us to draw some sort of conclusions about how we feel about foxes and how we treat them. Are they vermin or are they uh, a beautiful part of our natural community? So I'm joined now by Jennifer White, Media and Communications Manager for the animal welfare charity PETA and firearms dealer and writer Diggory Haddock. Uh, let me come um, to you first, Jennifer. Foxes, friend or foe? Absolutely, friend. Um, I mean, the, the problem here is that humans shouldn't be labelling foxes as pests in the first place. And the reason we largely do this is because of speciesism, which is the belief that some species are more important uh, than others. And it's something that we're all taught growing up, that some animals are friends, like puppies and kittens. Other animals are food, like cows and pigs. And then some animals, like foxes and rats and mice, are pests or vermin. And the problem with this is that our language around these animals determines how we treat them. And if we look at foxes especially, we can see that over the years, you know, they're subjected to being hunted, to being culled or killed, you know, for the slightest inconvenience and mistreated in so many other ways. Uh, and that's just not right. Of course, they deserve to live free from harm, as all animals do. Did, did you just say speciesism, Jennifer? <laughs> like prejudice against certain species? So, hang yeah, on, are, are you, so do we do you include humans in that? Are we or we, yeah. presumably humans, humans are, are the, the worst than a, than a rat. better than yeah, absolutely. Humans are the ones who believe that they are better than other species, and that's how we justify mistreating them for a sandwich filler or a handbag. <laughs> uh, and it's actually world day to end speciesism tomorrow. So, this are you is taking well the time. Mickey? Jennifer, come on, you've got to be swinging the lead. Are you telling me that the mouse, which currently lives under my fridge and comes out every night at 10 o'clock, and believe me, I'm trying to kill it, and I, he is winning at the moment, are you telling me that mouse is as important as my children? I mean, I think that mouse certainly deserves a, a chance to be removed humanely, which doesn't sound like you've been giving him or her. Uh, and that's really not the point. It's not comparing your children necessarily to specific animals. It's about how humans generally mistreat and exploit animals, which is something that we see every but the, day. But, but, but Jennifer, the mouse, the mouse is mistreating me. The mouse is mistreating me by pooing all under my sofa and eating the crumbs off my floor. I'm desperate to get rid of the mice in my house. I'm, I'm trying all sorts of things to do it. But let me, let me just bring in our, our other guest, um, because uh, firearms dealer and writer Diggory had it. Diggory, do you, is it your job to help control pest where necessary? It's not my job, no. Um, I do have some experience of the situation. I used to live in North London and I had foxes in my garden from time to time. Um, I also was involved with the shooting estate in St Albans. Uh, where, uh, where we had foxes being caught in the um, urban environment by people who thought they were doing good work, removing them from the urban environment where they're a problem and dumping them over the M25 onto our estate where they thought they'd live a lovely, comfortable life. Um, really, what they're doing is just transferring a problem from one area 
to another area. And of course, the problem with um, with urban foxes is they they're used to eating rubbish, um, and they're habituated to people, and they have no life skills. They don't really compete with the rural foxes, which are much stronger and um, and more capable of defending their territory. So what you end up with is a bunch of bemused foxes wandering about, not really knowing what they're doing. They then start going through people's rubbish bins and going towards people's chicken coops and things, and they get shot. Um, this is just a fact of life. So people that think they're moving stuff out of the out of the urban environment and doing it a favour. They're really not. They're just putting a poor, bemused animal that's incapable of looking after itself in a situation where vermin controllers will quite rightly uh, shoot it and dispatch it. Oh, Jennifer, I can see you flinching at the rampant speciesism of, of foxes taken from their urban environment on a little country holiday and then succumbing to the to the wilds of, of nature. Just, just respond to that, because what the start of that story is you've got a fox in an urban environment causing a problem, going through bins, keeping people awake, leaving piles of poo on my front step every morning. And so people are trying to do the right thing. What should we do with those foxes otherwise? Well, there's so many humane ways that people can address this perceived issue, which, you know, are mainly in habitat modification and repellent. So, for example, if you don't want foxes in your garden, something very simple to do is remove any food sources, make sure you're putting away your rubbish properly, um, blocking any holes or any other obvious access points, and then putting down repellents as well, which will deter foxes from coming into your garden. But of is course, we do need to remember that this country used to be covered in forests and in these animals' natural habitats, and we have encroached on them, we have displaced them. They are constantly being pushed around from new roads, buildings being built, uh, and you know, they're still willing to live harmoniously with us, so surely we can do them that same courtesy. I'm so sorry, I'm getting giggles. I mean, we've got housing problems with human beings, which is why we've had to build houses. We couldn't not build the houses so the foxes could still run around in their, in their forest. Let me tell you what happens on my, house, on my street. So our bins get put out on a Tuesday night. The foxes, literally look at their watches and go, guys, it's Tuesday, get down to that road in Chiswick. And all of our, the next morning, the recycling is just, the rubbish is strewn all over the roads on that particular night. Not on any other night, we're not leaving food out willy-nilly on the driveway for them. We're certainly not encouraging them. So what do we do about that? Do we just have to live with it? Well, there's so many ways, you know, by putting your recycling into, into bins, which foxes can't get into, for example, is one way to do it. But we do need to learn how to live harmoniously with these animals. And that is certainly not down the barrel of a gun. And we know that killing these animals, um, you know, through culling schemes, not only is it cruel, but it's completely ineffective because all it does is create a, a vicious killing cycle of more foxes than moving into the areas where uh, the ones who've been killed have been removed from. Um, and that's absolutely not the answer. Answer. and really foxes just deserve to be left in peace. Diggory, so it, even in yes. even in the countryside the foxes deserve to be left in peace. What's your, what do you think? Well, we live on a small island and we have um, classic examples of human animal conflict where basically we want to use land for our purposes and then we have animals that live on it as well, which is fine. We can live in a certain degree of harmony, but it involves a managed, a managed environment and that's what we do. So a few foxes is fine, too many foxes becomes a problem. So we shoot the numbers that are a problem. Um, that way, we, we've, we're in no danger of running out of foxes. There are 430,000 in the UK, there are 10,000 in London. So the problem with the, the urban ones particularly is their, um, the diseases that they carry around, toxoplasmosis, sarcoptic mange, which can be passed on to uh, domestic animals. Um, and also is a miserable thing for a fox to live with. I would say that if you have a fox in your garden and you're happy with it, be happy with it. Um, if you're trying to move it on, as our, uh, as our other guest here suggested, all you're doing is repelling it from your garden and moving the problem somewhere else so somebody else has to deal with it and just moving it around. That's not a solution. Um, if you've got foxes with mange, I suggest you call in a pest controller who's licensed to come in and effectively shoot it with a small caliber rifle. It will be painless and instant. The fox won't even know you're there and you put it out of its misery. Um, living with sarcoptic mange, which is a kind of scabies, is a hideous existence for an animal. Mm. And, uh, you know, people often criticize hunters for 
uh, as wanton destroyers of wildlife. We're not. We live in, uh, in harmony with nature and we abhor animal cruelty. Mm. Um, but uh, humanely mm. killing a, a, an unwell animal is just a sensible and humane thing to do. OK, lovely to talk to you both. I think we all agree that animal cruelty in and of itself is a terrible thing and we wouldn't support that. And I would love to have this debate again. I think I've probably got a lot to learn uh, from both of you. Uh, thank you very much. Jennifer White there, Media and Communications Manager for the Animal Welfare Charity PETA and Firearms Dealer and Writer Diggory Haddock. Now, in the last hour... I'm still giggling about the speciesism. I'm going to pull myself together. Right, in the last hour... The Chancellor, Nadim Zahawi, has delivered his message to the public following the energy price cap rise announcement. This is what he had to say. Uh, clearly, there is real anxiety uh, amongst uh, uh, the population, both in terms of people's uh, household energy, gas and electricity, but also uh, businesses, um, especially SMEs, which I am also focusing on. Um, the help we're putting in at the moment, the 37 billion, we are part of the way through. Um, so the help coming in um, from October onwards, um, if everybody's bill will get £400 off that uh, in terms of uh, the additional um, uh, increase now, sort of deals with about half of it. Um, but we know that's not enough. Uh, we've got to do more. Uh, I've been working up options. The moment I walked into this building on the 5th of July, uh, I tasked the team with two things. One, let's get this £37 billion out of the door, so if you're a pensioner, you get another £300. The next tranche of the £650 for the most vulnerable households, the 8 million households, is also going out. But the second thing I said was, we know, and I knew then, that Putin will continue to use energy as a weapon, as a way of getting back at us uh, for the help we're putting into Ukraine. We need to remain resilient. We need to make sure that this isn't a sticking plaster that for the long term. We continue to help the most vulnerable who have no, no cushion, and that's what I'm determined to do. And we're working up those options for both households and for business for the incoming Prime Minister on the 5th of September to take those decisions. So my message today is we'll get this £37 billion, uh, to people's, uh, you know, to help them for now, and then more will be coming uh, because we know this will continue in January and, of course, on to April and next year. And we have to remain resilient because the message I want to be able to send to Mr Putin that the nation wants to send is this will not work. We will continue to face you down. We'll continue to help Ukraine because you have illegally invaded a free and democratic country. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. What we're hearing and what all of you notice is that the reason we're in this position is there was no forward planning. They always knew that Putin was not to be trusted. So how have they got us into this situation where we're reliant on him when they won't even sit down at the table with him ever and have a cup of tea and yet we're reliant on him to put our own kettles on? Anyway, Drew, you agree with me. Surely this cannot all be down to Russia. It is clearly that for many reasons our energy system is broken exactly. Uh, Luna says, I cannot pay this. I don't don't have the money. It equals 49% of my disability benefits. It's outrageous. And Mick has said maybe the government should get their priorities right, cancel the cap prize and use the £100 billion earmarked for the pointless HS2 project and scrap that vanity project. No one will be able to afford to use it. And everyone's working from home anyway, Mick. It slightly undermines the need for us to get around the country, doesn't it now? Um, Right, keep your call, keep your uh, your views coming to me, won't you? GB views at gbnews.uk. Okay, we're go it's Friday. We're gonna have a little bit of a lighter moment now. A bit of showbiz uh, with the best showbiz reporter in the business. Now, the '90s hit show Gladiator is set to entertain a whole new generation of viewers as it returns to our screens next year. Remember this lot? Oh, look, that's Sharon Davis. She's often on GB News. Uh, production company Hungry Bear are bringing the program to the BBC and say. It is the perfect time for the show to return to the screen as what other show combines electric excitement, don't mention electric, that was bad putting that in your PR release, electric excitement, superheroes, giant sponge fingers, elite athletes and a pinch of pantomime. Well, I for one loved Gladiator. So here to discuss this and other showbiz stories of the day is our reporter Stephanie Tetchy. Steph, lovely to see you. Um, were, were you yeah, a Gladiator fan? Were you a Gladiator I am fan? A massive, 
I am a massive Gladiators fan. Like, seriously, I feel like TV has lost its way recently. And you're finding that people are having to go back to drawing boards and bring out all these classic shows which people know and love. And Gladiators was one of them. It was one of the first kind of real TV shows where you could really see athletic TV fans getting there, getting out there against all these TV contenders. And it was incredible. You know, it's been 20 years since it's been off our screens. and But while it was on, it was bringing millions and millions yeah. of viewers. I don't even know why it came off our TV screen in the first place. Yeah, it's a good point, actually. I remember it signposted when Gladiators won. You knew it was Saturday night and you were probably going to go out and have a few drinks and go dancing. And it was the time you had your, your pre-clubbing pizza was watching Gladiators, <laughs> obviously while looking at all the women who look like that. <laughs> they all look amazing. Do we know who's going to present it, Steph? Because it used to be Ulrika Johnson, of course, didn't it? No, so the new presenters haven't been announced. So the show's not going to be back till 2023 on BBC One, hopefully. Um, but they still being a bit quiet about who's going to be the actual gladiators themselves, who's going to be presenting the shows. And for me personally, I would have loved to see the referee, John Anderson, come back. But right now, he's 90. And I remember he used to have this quote, contenders, are you ready? But he's yeah. not going to be coming back, unfortunately. Gladiators, ready! And his Scottish accent, didn't he? It was brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, well, I hope, I hope he makes an appearance in some way. It would be great to see him there, wouldn't it? What else is going on in showbiz, Steph? Well, now, Colleen Rooney, so we know that big libel trial which she won against Rebecca Vardy. During the whole court case, Bev, you know, um, she was very quiet during the whole case, Colleen Rooney. She didn't say much. But now she signed a multi-million pound deal with Disney+. Plus. So she's going to be having a documentary where she'll be discussing her journey during the case. You know, it will really be her chance to kind of talk about what happened, how she felt. Apparently, she's been documenting the whole case, how she, how she felt about her journey, the verdict and all this stuff. Because, you know, Rebecca Vardy has had her say in this case, but Rebecca's really, I mean, Colleen's been very quiet about it. So this will be her first chance to speak about what's been going on. And, you know, she's just known as a wag, really. But really, she's going to be out earning Wayne with this because she, sound, she signed a multi-million pound contract for this. She's a funny old wag, isn't she, Colleen Rooney? Because I know they come in different sort of shades. She's stuck around for all these years. She's had Wayne Rooney, yeah. uh, allegedly... Um, having some extramarital yeah. activities, and yet she seems incre she seems to remain incredibly down to earth. It looks like being a mum is really important to her. You see her at airports loaded with bags and mm. kids, and she's not surrounded by nannies. She sometimes has a mum with her. I think she's actually played yeah. quite a good hand, really, in the life that she's led, and I kind of wish her nothing but luck. Same here. I love Colleen. I think she's actually a very strong woman because, to be honest, like she's been through drama with Wayne. Now she's had this wagger for Christie trial. It's like it's always too much for most women to take on, but she's remained dignified. And you know, I really am looking forward to this documentary because I think we'll get to know Colleen on a different level and how she actually feels about things. And to be honest, she's done it with class, and that's what we women yeah. should have. Yeah, absolutely. As you have in spades, Stephanie. Uh, <laughs> Stephanie Tetchy there with our showbiz news. Thanks for joining us. Now, keep your thoughts coming into us on email, won't you? GBviews at gbnews.uk. I'm going to be back with more of today's top stories and plenty of your views after this very short break. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness, mate. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7pm for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panellists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. 
At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good morning. You are listening to and watching to the point on GB News with me, Bev Turner, on TV, radio, and online. If you haven't uploaded the nifty little app, do so. It's brilliant. Now we are with you until midday with the show jam packed with all of today's biggest stories, discussion, guests, and opinion, as well as yours. Make sure you get in touch with your views as usual on GB Views at GBNews.uk. I'm going to be doing a monologue at some point in the next hour about how I feel about Rishi Sunak trying to backpedal on all of his COVID policies. You really want to stick around uh, to listen to that. But first of all, it's the latest news with Rihanna. Bev, thank you. Good morning. It's one minute past 11. Your top stories from the GB newsroom. Energy bills are set to rise by more than 80%, hitting households already struggling through the cost of living crisis. Ofgem has announced the price cap will increase from just under £2,000 to over £3,500 in October. The Chancellor, Nadim Zahawi, acknowledges the rise will cause stress for many, but says government help is coming. The help we're putting in at the moment, the £37 billion, we are part of the way through. Um, so the help coming in um, from October onwards, um, if everybody's bill will get £400 off that uh, in terms of uh, the additional um, uh, increase now, sort of deals with about half of it. Um, but we know that's not enough. Uh, we've got to do more. Uh, I've been working up options. The moment I walked into this building on the 5th of July, uh, I tasked the team with two things. One, let's get this £37 billion out of the door. So if you're a pensioner, you get another £300. The next tranche of the £650 for the most vulnerable households, the 8 million households, is also going out. While those already tightening their belts fear there's worse to come. You know, I'm lucky enough that this next price cap rise might not mean we can't buy food, but it's a pattern that means that things become more difficult for us and maybe if it happens again, we're in trouble. It is hard. And the only, way, uh, only solution I've got at the moment is um, possibly moving in one of my um, uh, kids, uh, their wife and, the two, uh, and the, uh, two of my grandchildren, so I can make ends meet. There's definitely been a massive increase in, in the supermarkets. I mean, I shop in there, in, in, in some super, in, in, even in the budget supermarkets like Lidl's, Aldi, the prices have changed dramatically in, in the sort of like the last sort of three to six months. What I'm definitely doing is you spend what's on what's important. What you don't need to do, you don't do it and try and budget as much as possible. A 36-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell in Liverpool. The nine-year-old was shot in her home on Monday night after a gunman chased another man into her home in the Dovecot area of the city. Former Liverpool uh, player Ian Rush and ex-Everton player Ian Snowden left flowers on behalf of the Merseyside football clubs. Police say the suspect, who's from Highton, was arrested during an operation involving armed officers. The number of people crossing the English Channel in small boats this year has passed 24,000. Ministry of Defence figures show more than 800 migrants crossed in 16 small boats yesterday. That's the second busiest day of the year so far. That as the cost of the UK's asylum system topped £2 billion a year for the first time, following the highest number of claims in two decades. 
A GB News People's Poll has found the majority of Brits prefer a Labour government with Sir Keir Starmer at the helm than a Conservative one under Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. The survey shows Labour holds a 14% lead over the Tories. The findings conducted by People Polling also reveals the word that comes to mind the most about Tory leadership frontrunner Liz Truss is untrustworthy. Professor of Politics at the University of Kent, Matthew Goodwin, says it could mean the Conservatives will have less support at the next general election. There is a risk here. Uh, clearly in these numbers, that if, if things don't change, uh, the Conservatives are looking at a sort of 1997-2001 scenario where they not only lose that all-important red wall in Northern England, but they also lose a large chunk of that blue wall across the south. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has accused Russia of nearly causing a radiation disaster at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. It's after the Zaporizhia facility was temporarily cut off from Ukraine's power grid. President Zelensky's blamed shelling by Russian forces, allegations Moscow denies. He said the plant was only able to operate safely due to backup electricity kicking in. And he's praised Ukrainian technicians at the plant. And more than 100,000 Royal Mail workers have walked off the job in a dispute over pay. It's the first of four days of industrial action, with strikes also taking place on the 31st, as well as next month on the 8th and 9th. The Communication Workers' Union says it's the biggest strike in the UK since 2009. It's demanding a pay rise that more closely reflects the current rate of inflation. Royal Mail has warned letters won't be delivered and some parcels will be delayed. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. It's back to Bev with To The Point. Good morning, you are watching Bev Turner on GB News, on your radio and online. We've got a great show this morning until uh, midday. I'm here, here's what's on the menu. A town at the centre of one of Britain's most notorious child sex scandals is set to be named as the world's first children's capital of culture. I'll be speaking to the founder of Parents Against Grooming UK and an expert in extremism to find out if we're being trolled. Uh, next up, average households in Britain are set to pay an extra 1,600 quid in their annual energy bills from the 1st of October. I'll be looking at what impact this will have on already struggling families. And finally, today marks International Dog Day, a day to celebrate our favourite pets, puppies and hounds. Many of you have sent in photos of your furry friends, which we always love to show. So keep them coming in. We've got all of that coming up and much more across the programme. You can get in touch with your views as usual, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Now, a town at the centre of one of Britain's most notorious child sex scandals is set to be named as the world's first children's capital of culture. The Rotherham child sexual exploitation scandal consisted of abuse that occurred in the late 1980s until the early 2000s, with local authorities failing to recognise and act, act on reports of abuse. You're all very familiar with this story. It's very upsetting and it feels like things don't particularly change. But the government has now revealed that it's reviewing the decision to award Rotherham £1.8 million in taxpayers' cash to fund the year-long children's capital of culture initiative in 2025 so i'm pleased to be joined uh, by billy howarth founder of parents against grooming uk and wasik wasik political commentator who has written about rotherham recently uh, wasik let's let's start with you you've written a lot about this i mean it's easy for us first of all to be uh, sort of very cynical about naming Rotherham the children's city of culture. But you know what, if I take my cynical hat off just for a moment, maybe this is what the children of Rotherham need. They need investment, they need opportunity. Frankly, they, they need fun. 
Yeah, well, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, children do definitely need uh, investment in their future, but we need to think about the victims of the grooming gangs because their childhood has been robbed as a result of uh, these uh, perpetrators who took advantage of them, ply them with alcohol and drugs uh, just to get what they want, uh, which was their sexual satisfaction. And so their childhood has been robbed and they're not going to get that back. And so when... Um, Rotherham seems to be um, on this uh, um, road towards becoming the children's cultural cap uh, children's capital of culture seems to be a slap in the face for those victims. Absolutely. And, and Billy, let me just come to you. Does this, I know you've fought long and hard for the children of Rotherham. You've been fighting for justice for several years now. Does this government initiative feel a bit like tokenism to you? Would you rather they did something that actually makes a difference to the grooming gang culture? Absolutely, definitely not. Um, I think I think it's a it, it's a two-edged sword, isn't it? You know, until we get accountability, then these people are still in position that ignore child abuse. So it doesn't matter how much money you give them, the morality mm -hmm. is still the lack of morality is still there. So what needs to Same be done, people. Billy? What what should they be doing now in Rotherham? Well, well, I back what Maggie Oliver said last time she was on your show. She said, "Put these people in the dock who failed. Put them in a court." That's what must happen. That's the only way this will stop. That's the only way we can move forward. Uh, until then, it's just going to keep happening. Barrow, Rochdale, Rotherham, Telford, all across the country. And you're talking specifically about police officers as much as potential perpetrators of crimes? Oh, no, no. This goes right the way up, as I've said previously on your show, from the Gordon Brown Prime Minister all the way down. Um, a lot of them, they all need to be held to account. They made a decision at the top to set these girls' chaotic lifestyles were the reason for their own abuse. They've got to face the music for that. Because well, on the back of that memo, thousands were abused in the UK, not just Robram and Rochdale. Absolutely. Barrow. And, and Wasi, were you heartened to hear Rishi Sunak say, was it only yesterday, a day before, in one of the hostings, that he doesn't think, um, I think it was last night, in fact, that political correctness shouldn't get in the way of um, justice? And, and he was alluding to um, men of, of Pakistani origin not being arrested or not being questioned for allegations of child sex abuse. Well, yes, uh, I mean, that's positive uh, coming from uh, Rishi Sunak. And I think what we now need to see is that put into practice. So um, in, in terms of the Alexis J report that was uh, conducted in 2014, just after um, it was discovered that <clears throat> this was taking place, one of the failures was uh, political correctness. And uh, as a result of that, what we found was the authorities were using so-called, um, quote unquote, uh, community leaders uh, as a conduit to, within the community where a lot of these perpetrators were coming from. And the reason why they were doing that is uh, that they were um, hoping to not cause offence and not focus so much on the racial aspect or the ethnic aspect of the perpetrators. But the fact is that political correctness is something that has systematically failed these victims. And yes, it's great um, that Rishi Sunak says that it shouldn't be a barrier. We now need to see that in practice and see what can come about as a result of that. So, Billy, let's let's look at this story, this this children's mm -hmm. capital of culture for 2025. Um, you are going to be getting the town will be packed uh, with music, magic, dance, drama, films, food, exhibitions and events and events. There'll be training and skills, one point eight million pound from the government. Does this feel a bit like an apology to the town? Oh, that's a shame. We've lost him. I think we've... Is Wasik still there? I don't know if we've lost both of them. Wasik is still there. Let me come to you then, uh, Wasik. Uh, we're just looking at what this project is. Does it look like an apology from the government for the, to the people and particularly to the children of Rotherham? There's certainly that perception. Um, I, I, I seem to remember a local councillor actually um, congratulating the... The, the town for um, uh, being able to um, achieve this um, this feat uh, to get the children's cult uh, capital of culture. And what he inadvertently said was that uh, 
the, the improvements that are going to be made are going to help change the perception of Rotherham. But the fact is, the perception of Rotherham is that it is at the heart of uh, the scandal of grooming gangs and a systematic failure of uh, vulnerable children, uh, white working class children, against uh, mostly uh, British Pakistani men. And so that's the perception that we have. And I don't think we should be losing that perception as um, through this uh, ch uh, children's capital of culture. I think it should be seen differently. It should be seen certainly for um, our future generation of children, but we should never forget our past generation of children who were let down uh, because of our authorities. Yeah, absolutely. Well, keep up your good work of shining a light on this and we will to Wasik Wasik there, a commentator on this particular issue. Uh, let me know what you think, uh, GB Views at GB News. Dot UK. I'm sure you will have some opinions on that. Rotherham's, uh, the children's capital of culture is a sick joke, according to some. Um, Leveling up Secretary Greg Clark has said he will look again at the funding. And while the young people of Rotherham are certainly more than deserving of the opportunities the festival might bring, this is what Wasik Wasik was saying in his piece, there is a danger here. It was spelled out inadvertently by a local councillor. Back in February, councillor Dave Shepherd said, we're making improvements that will help the perception of Rotherham. In other words, it seems the local authority hopes the festival will encourage us to move on from the town's catastrophic failings. And that would be no bad thing as long as they have done something about the initial problem rather than just bringing the fair to town. Right, GB views on energy. You were all letting me know about this. Uh, Dawn said, amazing, isn't it? Um, our own people are being put in this mess, but illegal migrants are coming in their thousands. They're put in hotels, all paid for by the taxpayer, and more money is going to Ukraine. A lot of you are sort of shocked by those Boris, the Boris Johnson statement about the fact that, um, you know, you might be cold, but um, what did he say? But the Ukrainian people are, are paying in their blood. Very emotive. And I think shows a lack of empathy for what British people are going through here. Danny says there's something very wrong in this country. It's about time our own people came first. A lot of you are echoing this sentiment. And Joe says the government help is misguided. The average worker cannot access these benefits. Everyone will need help, not just those on benefits. Right, after the break. Uh, we polled you, the people of Britain, asking who you would rather have in government. Trust Sunak or Starmer. The results may surprise you. Tune in after the weather to find out what you said. Hello, Alex Deacon here with your latest weather updates. A bank holiday for much of the UK and most places won't see much rain. It's going to be fine and bright with sunny spells. Some of the coasts, though, could turn quite windy, especially by Monday. The fine weather is being created by an area of high pressure moving in, but it's not with us just yet. This weather front today is bringing a few scattered showers across parts of the west, Wales and southwest Scotland in particular, seeing one or two heavy showers. The showers fading from Northern Ireland, dry and bright here and across northwest Scotland and for much of the Midlands and eastern parts of England, where we had quite a bit of rain yesterday. It's a much drier and brighter scene here with sunny spells. Still quite warm. It's not as humid as it was earlier in the week, but the temperatures getting into the 20s, maybe the mid-20s across the southeast. Cooler where we've got that weather from that line of cloud, still providing a few showers into the evening. They'll tend to fade away. Most places will have a dry night. Could turn a bit misty once more. Some fog patches possible across East Anglia and the southeast. Not going to last too long into Saturday, but if you are getting away for the bank holiday early in the morning, that's just something to bear in mind. A fresher night, temperatures down into single figures across Scotland and Northern Ireland. On to the details for Saturday, and it's not going to be completely dry. There is the chance still of one or two showers, mostly over parts of northern England, but even further south, one or two are possible. But I say for the vast majority, it will stay dry. Clouding over across the north coast of Northern Ireland and the western Isles of Scotland with a little rain here later on. Most places, though, dry, bright, sunny spells, probably a touch warmer than today with temperatures high teens, low to mid 20s. Still, the odd shower here and there on Saturday evening. We will see a bit more rain just coming into the far northwest of Scotland. But again, most places staying dry on Saturday night, thanks to high pressure, which holds on onto Sunday. And again, many places dry and bright. As the high moves in, though, it will bring a cool breeze in the east coast and a brisk breeze on Monday on the south coast. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. 
you've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farrow. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2pm. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain Saturday and Sunday from 2pm? Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Good morning, it's 11.21, it's Friday of a bank holiday weekend and you are watching To The Point with Bev Turner on GB News. We're also on your, TV, on your online uh, and radio this morning, in your computer, in your telly and in your radio. Now, moving on. Have the wheels come off the Conservative Party? Hmm, a GB News People's Poll finds the majority of Brits would prefer a Labour government with Keir Starmer at the helm rather than a Conservative government under Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. It comes as Labour currently hold a 14% lead over the Tories. The findings were conducted by people polling and they also discovered that the word that comes to mind the most about the front runner in the Tory leadership, Liz Truss, is untrustworthy. Now, last night, Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss clashed over energy costs at the penultimate hustings of the Conservative leadership race. But whose economic plan will fare better during this cost of living crisis? So joining me now is Charlie Peters, writer and broadcaster. Thanks for joining me, Charlie. Lovely to see you again. Um, were you surprised by the results of that poll? That's putting not only, lead, not only Labour, but Keir Starmer with a significant lead over the Conservatives if we had a general election tomorrow? I think not enormously surprising when you consider that this Hustings campaign, this leadership election has been going on for so long. And I'm sure you, many of the other GB News team and, and pretty much all of your viewers probably think that this competition has been dragging on for ages. And as it does, and as these two candidates kind of continue to take pop shots at each other, I think the Conservative brand is being damaged enormously. We've got Rishi Sunak on one hand, chucking out desperate red meat policies every five seconds as he languishes in second place by some distance. And, and Liz Truss, I think, steadily realising that her brand of libertarian free market economics isn't necessarily going to capture the heart of the nation 
straight away faced with these enormous costs. So amid this kerfuffle and this continuing leadership election, I think lots of people are rightly saying, well, what's the alternative? Someone who's probably going to chuck cash at me right away and isn't going to have these enormously bizarre um, statements every five minutes attempting to capture my attention. So in a way, Charlie, you think that this is not necessarily about Keir Starmer impressing people by what he says or the plans that he has. It's more about the reputation that Labour might have to give away some money. But also, it's about a shot across the bowels for what people see as the Conservative Party being self-indulgent, navel-gazing and ignoring the public, in a nutshell. In a nutshell, yes. And, and I think, you know, um, the Conservatives were lucky the last two general elections. The person they were facing was Jeremy Corbyn, enormously unpopular, a man who was very easy to run over when they, they took an easy shot at him, when they had the, uh, the appropriate planning with the 2019 manifesto, which was actually put together properly in contrast to the 2017 disaster class. So um, they've had it easy. They've had it easy for five years. And now faced with someone who admittedly is enormously boring and doesn't, doesn't capture the hearts of the nation in a particularly easy way, um, they are facing someone who is at, at least more competent. Now, in the kind of, uh, in, the word, in the word response that you got there with your, with your polling, the GB News polling there, the top word was untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure if you did the same for Keir Starmer, and perhaps GB News will do that soon in its polling, um, the responses might not be as fascinating, but they will refer to the kind of steadiness and, the, uh, and certainly more trustworthiness than you can rely on with the current two Conservative candidates. So I think that does create a contrast, which the public will find very interesting as they lean into these uh, disastrous energy costs. Now, um, Chancellor Nadim Zahawi, it's easy to forget that he's Chancellor, actually. Um, he's been talking this morning about the energy crisis. Let's have a listen, Charlie, and then let me know what you think of what he had to say. Here it is. Uh, clearly, there is real anxiety uh, amongst uh, uh, the population, both in terms of people's uh, household energy, gas and electricity, but also uh, businesses, um, especially SMEs, which I am also focusing on. Um, the help we're putting in at the moment, the 37 billion, we are part of the way through. Um, so the help coming in um, from October onwards, um, if everybody's bill, will get 400 pounds off that uh, in terms of uh, the additional um, uh, increase now, sort of deals with about half of it. Um, but we know that's not enough. Uh, we've got to do more. Uh, I've been working up options. The moment I walked into this building on the 5th of July, uh, I tasked the team with two things. One, let's get this 37 billion out of the door. So if you're a pensioner, you get another 300 pounds. The next tranche of the 650 pounds for the most vulnerable households, the 8 million households, is also going out. But the second thing I said was, we know, and I knew then, that Putin will continue to use energy as a weapon as a way of getting back at us uh, for the help we're putting into Ukraine. We need to remain resilient. We need to make sure that this isn't a sticking plaster that for the long term. We continue to help the most vulnerable who have no, no cushion. And that's what I'm determined to do. And we're working up those options for both households and for business for the incoming prime minister on the 5th of September to take those decisions. So my message today is we'll get this 37 billion uh, to people's uh, you know, to help them for now, and then more will be coming uh, because we know this will continue in January and, of course, onto April and next year. And we have to remain resilient because the message I want to be able to send to Mr. Putin that the nation wants to send is this will not work. We will continue to face you down. We'll continue to help Ukraine because you have illegally invaded a free and democratic country. So, Charlie, what do you make of that? Well, he's not going to be Chancellor next month, let's be honest. It's almost certainly going to be quasi Quateng. And it's true that um, he has built in this multi-billion pound package. But the next Prime Minister is almost certainly going to be Liz Truss. And her Chancellor, um, quasi Quateng, they do not seem necessarily as eager as the current kind of false administration in terms of pushing money into the system. Indeed, Liz Truss said last night at these hustings, with Julia Hartley Brewer, that the solution to the energy crisis is not to, quote, bung more cash into the system, and that there needs to be supply side reforms. And I happen to agree with that. We do need more nuclear energy, we need more renewables, we'll need more oil from the North Sea. But at the same time, there is going to be an urgent need to cover the cost in the short term. 
But Liz Truss has said this is not a short-term crisis. It's going to go on for some time. And while that is true, there are also apparently reports that Truss and, and Kwarteng have met in Chevening at the, uh, the Foreign Secretary's residence to build up a new multi-billion pound package. So perhaps a continuation on the one that's currently going on. Maybe it'll be reduced, but rebranded. We don't know. But either way, um, anxiety is going to be very high. And Liz Truss will have to move away from her natural libertarian instinct, which is not to throw more cash at a problem. She will almost certainly have to move into a short-term, high-spend, high-borrow strategy to deal with the crisis that's facing us. Because if she doesn't, let's be frank, thousands of Britons are going to die. This is not a game. This is not some sort of, um, can the government do this? Can the market do this short-term little issue of political ideology? This is very simply about British lives, thousands of them, possibly tens of thousands of them at risk. Yeah. You see, you're right, Charlie. Um, we have to move on. I've got, we're going to go. Always nice to see you, uh, Charlie Peters there. Um, so, listen, I, I feel like I, I agree with, you know, what Charlie was largely saying. Of course I do. And, and you know what? Normally when, when people come on the telly and they say thousands of people are going to die, it's often an exaggeration. But I genuinely think in this situation it isn't because the cold kills more people than any heat wave ever did every single year. Now, after the break, energy regulator Ofgem announced a the price cap will increase, as we heard, from 1971 to 3,549 from the 1st of October. October. I'm going to be joined by our London reporter, Alice Porter, asking the public their thoughts on the rise. But before that, a look at this morning's news. Good morning. It's 11.30. I'm Rhiannon Jones in the GB newsroom. Energy bills will rise by more than 80% from October, with Ofgem announcing the price cap will increase from just under £2,000 to over £3,500. The Chancellor, Nadine Zahawi, acknowledges the rise will cause stress for many, but says government help is coming. Clearly, there is real anxiety uh, amongst uh, uh, the population, both in terms of people's uh, household energy, gas and electricity, but also uh, businesses. I've been working up options. The moment I walked into this building on the 5th of July, uh, I tasked the team with two things. One, let's get this £37 billion out of the door. So if you're a pensioner, you get another £300. The next tranche of the £650 for the most vulnerable households, the 8 million households, is also going out. A 36-year-old man has been arrested on suspicion of the murder of Olivia Pratt Corbell in Liverpool. The nine-year-old was shot in her home on Monday night. This morning, Liverpool legend Ian Rush and ex-Everton player Ian Snowden left flowers near the scene on behalf of the Merseyside football clubs. Police say the suspect, who's from Highton, was arrested during an operation involving armed officers. And more than 100,000 Royal Mail workers have walked off the job today in a dispute over pay. It's the first of four days of industrial action, with strikes also taking place on the 31st, as well as next month on the 8th and 9th. The Communication Workers' Union is demanding a pay rise that better reflects the current rate of inflation. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound will buy you $1.184 and €1.182. The price of gold currently stands at £1,476.81 per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News, investments that matter. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle, 
Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good morning, it's 11.34. This is To The Point with me, Bev Turner, on GB News, live on your TV, radio and online this morning. Now, Rishi Sunak says that lockdowns could have been shorter, different, quicker. We could be in a very different place. He says now, with the benefit of hindsight, that some of us never needed. Apparently, as the economy tanks, he regrets the government's COVID strategy stating that the scientists at SAGE should never have been put in charge of the country's response. Well, who knew? Thanks for that, Rishi. Now I can sleep at night. Except, of course, I can't and I won't until there are arrests over the despotic, unscientific measures of the scamdemic and the perverted profits sucked up by vampirical pharmaceutical companies, aided and abetted by a media paid off to the tune of £300 million, paid for by Rishi Sunak's department with our taxpayers' money. If you empower all these independent people, you're screwed, he now says in reference to SAGE. We shouldn't have empowered the scientists in the way that we did. True, especially when a leading member of SAGE is a lifelong member of the Communist Party and might just have enjoyed that frisson of power. But Rishi's wrong. You can empower scientists, except that as with any medical decision, the consequences of which could be life-changing, you always seek a second opinion. Are you telling us, Rishi Sunak, that you didn't have the chance at one of your SAGE meetings to ask them to read, your colleagues to read, the Great Barrington Declaration, for instance? That statement written in October 2020 by some of the world's top epidemiologists and public health scientists, in which they expressed their grave concerns about the damaging physical and mental health impacts of your policies, instead recommending more focused protection for the vulnerable. They were publicly discredited as fringe, according to leaked emails, and denounced as quacks. You should have had the gumption, Rishi Sunak, to insist to your team that there might have been a different way. Sunak conceded, you have to acknowledge trade-offs from the beginning. If we'd done all of that, we could be in a very different place. Do you think? Is he finally referencing the necessity of a cost-benefit analysis of lockdowns? Indulge me for a minute while I show you a clip of me in June 2020, less than three months after the first lockdown. Lockdowns are not medical. Lockdowns are political. They are based on a misattribution of data. They are based on poor testing statistics. They're based on a disease in which 98% of people who catch it will be fully recovered within three months. And now, I don't show you that as an I told you so. Well, I do a bit actually, it's quite satisfying. Uh, but let me tell you, after making such statements on TV, I was vilified by the press, demonised on social media and written off by former employers as a selfish granny killer. 
But it was so obvious if you chose to look. You didn't need to be the Chancellor to see what was coming. You just needed to switch off the BBC, seek out people who were looking at facts rather than trilling with emotion like this woman. And, and it's fine? That, if, that we kill a few million thousand, hundreds of thousand old people? We're Is that OK? No. But that's what there you're basically saying. No, when we started out on this, and Neil Ferguson had said there will be half a million dead in the UK, there is still only 350,000 dead in the world. So the figures were so wildly inaccurate that we have to readdress now. And they have to hold their hands up and say, the predictions were wrong. But Let's look at what we're dealing with. Let's look at his, the specific his people. Yeah, his, OK, his, most people can see Not now. Uh, GP Sarah, Sarah uh, Jarvis there, uh, my former adversary, who admitted to keeping her family outside on Christmas Day, even when the government said they could go inside. It wasn't easy taking a public stance for the poor, the old, the young, and anyone who was going to suffer harms from COVID theatre. But I did it anyway, because it was the right thing to do. In my opinion, Sunak's words paint a picture of a man who lacked the spine to publicly call out what he now says he knew were policy mistakes. How dare you, Rishi Sonak? how dare you? I will welcome, forgive and embrace anyone who holds up their hands and says, fair dues, Bev, there were two sides to that story after all. And it's happening every day now. I don't need apologies, but I do respect humility. But the Chancellor of the Exchequer, really, he wasn't a passenger when, long after we had a clear picture of the infection fatality rate, said nothing to stop confused 98-year-old care home residents having to mouth I love you through windows when all they wanted to do was to hold someone's hand. Sonak wasn't a passenger when schools closed, when the decades-old pandemic response plan was mysteriously ripped up in favour of a Chinese-style quarantine the healthy strategy. He wasn't a passenger when the chief medical officers took to the lecterns with baffling figures seemingly obfuscated to maintain the fear. He was a driver. He was one of a handful up front at the wheel, map in hand, as he helped drive the country into a brick wall with businesses closed, families destroyed, mental health problems exacerbated and some educational achievements lost forever. He was in on the meetings that decided the NHS must be solely obsessed with the disease that was involved in the deaths of those averaging 82 years of age. Thanks to the growing treatment backlog, he was well aware of, we are now deep in a period of excess weekly mortality in the relatively young, which dwarfs anything that COVID-19 managed. He also claims that it was he who thought up the eat out to help out scheme. By then, we knew that 75% of people in ICU with COVID were clinically obese. He might have been wiser to open all the gyms, pools and sports centres for free instead of encouraging us to eat twice as much for half the price. In every brief, we tried to stop the fear narrative, he now says. I constantly said it was wrong. No, you didn't. If you had genuinely believed that, you would have resigned noisily and defiantly with the backing of so many British people who could also see the COVID pantomime for what it was. You could have taken a temporary step off your own political career ladder. And ironically, you could have eventually come back free from the stains of the COVID oil slick in which this country is now drowning. You say, Rishi Sunak, that you were ticked off by the Cabinet Office after saying it was time to live without fear. So tell us, who didn't want to hear that? Name names now and put your money where your mouth is. It's actually hard to know who Sunak is aiming this about turn at. Those of us who stuck our own necks out to question the non-scientific policy, whether that was on TV or even just around a family dinner table, are not ready to forgive those who were in power. Sunak has even said that minutes from SAGE meetings were edited to omit dissenting voices from final drafts. This caused lawyer Francis Hoare to tweet, this is absolutely shocking. If this is true, then those responsible, and it is reasonable to suppose that Whitty and Valence were at least aware, should face a criminal investigation for misconduct in public office. Quite right. Sunak has thrown the scientists under the bus. They will now blame the politicians who took the decisions. The inevitable infighting 
will be bloody and brutal. And it will finally allow us to see behind the curtain and find out why, in my opinion, insanity was allowed to run riot. I will have my popcorn ready. Right, let me know what you thought about that. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Back to our top story today. Energy regulator Ofgem announced this morning that they will raise the energy price cap to 1,971 from 1,971 to 3,549 from the 1st of October. That means that the average household using a typical amount of electricity and gas will pay around £1,600 more a year in bills. That is £130 more a month than we already did. And that is not all. The price cap will be changed in three months' time, with economists predicting that it will be even higher. Analysts say that bills could peak at well over £5,000 next year. So let's see how the increases in the energy price cap are affecting both ends of the country this morning. GB News reporter Davy Donaldson is in Glasgow for us. Uh, Davy, what are people saying up there? Well, it's pretty gl gloomy looking in Glasgow at the moment. It's pretty gloomy in terms of what people are thinking and the outlook with regards to energy prices because people simply just cannot afford to pay that kind of money. Uh, so really, speaking to people in Glasgow today, the feeling amongst them is that what am I going to do? How am I going to pay this? And that's going to be replicated not just uh, in Glasgow but across Scotland and across the UK as well. People who just simply cannot manage that level of increase. 80% increase. And as you point out, we're not done yet because there's going to be another increase on the 31st of December. So uh, that's certainly something that's going to be even worse for people. You just get through Christmas, you've spent your money, and all of a sudden you go into the worst month financially of the year, January. And just before it, you get the announcement that it's going to be your energy bills are going to increase even further. Now, we have heard from the Scottish Government here, Michael Matheson, the Energy Secretary, released this statement today. He says, today's price cap announcement and increase imposes a burden that customers simply cannot expect to carry. The only acceptable course of action is now for the UK Government uh, and you have necessary policy levers and borrowing powers at their disposal to take immediate steps to cancel the increase for all households. That's something that the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has come out today. She's looking for a free. So we'll see what happens in this, but it's certainly very gloomy news as far as energy prices are concerned. It really is. Uh, thank you, Davy. Davy Donaldson there in Glasgow. Now, today marks 254 years since Yorkshire Captain James Cook set sail from Plymouth to try and discover the fabled Terra Australis on the other side of the world. A few months later, uh, he landed in Botany Bay. There he is, uh, looking uh, fabulous. Um, and he, he claimed that the land of Australia, uh, he claimed it, of course, for uh, the British, but these topics always raise all sorts of controversy, don't they? As some people like to try and rewrite history. Um, it seems that Australians uh, didn't like our Captain James Cook. Um, we're going to come back to that story in just a moment. I think we're trying to get hold of our, our guest. I hope he hasn't been cancelled as well. Uh, we're going to talk about statues and cancel culture there. Right, I'm going to go back to your, your views on, on energy. We were just hearing then, um, obviously, about from the people in Scotland saying, we don't know what we're going to do. How are we going to pay this? Uh, Dennis has said, the Tories have totally missed the point. It's now not just the vulnerable low incomes and pensioners. It is now the vast majority. You're absolutely right, because that average of, what was it, 150 quid extra a month? That's not easy to find. What, what do you cut back? Let me know what you're going to cut back at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Where will you make savings or what will you do? Will you just take out more credit? This is something we talked about, I think it was last week, about how people are going to make ends meet. Are they just going to access credit cards to pay for other things so that they can then pay their fuel bills. Is that what you're going to do? Uh, and Dave has said, um, trust tax cuts will give £6 of every £7 directly to the highest earners too. Uh, so they do not help the poorest. And Dave has said it is not surprising, as it was predicted by the government at the start of the Russian invasion. The shocking reality is that they both chose to hide this at the start and have taken no action to address the issue. Um, right, we're, we are moving on. I think, we've, I think we've ditched our Australia story, which is a bit of a shame. 
Uh, but, you know, it's not exactly uh, something that's particularly news occurring. I can take, bring that to you any day. We'll revisit that. Any Australians who are on the edge of your seat, uh, bear with us. Now, today is International Dog Day. It's a day to celebrate our favourite pets, puppies and hounds. Many of you have sent in photos of your furry fen friends, which I know you love to see and we like to show them. Uh, so joining me now is Lorna Winter, Director of the UK Dog Behaviour and Training Charter and co-founder and head of training at ZigZag. Uh, thank you very much uh, for coming on, Lorna. We really are a nation of dog lovers, aren't we? Yes, we do. Where does that come from? Do we know? What's the historical... Um, precedent for that where did it come from I think originally it started back in the day when um, dogs were helping us do our jobs you know out there in the fields and herding the sheep and eventually I think it was in the early um, 1800s it started to become more of a bringing the dogs at home taking them in and then we fell in love with them we really did, didn't we? Do we know, what, on average, how many pe people have dogs in this country? I think it's around 50 to 55% of households in the UK own a dog. And haven't we had this, this sad situation recently with people buying dogs during lockdown and thinking it was great fun to be at home with an animal to keep the kids happy? And what's happened now, Lorna? Yes, what we're seeing was what we call the pandemic um, surge in, in pet ownership. It wasn't just dogs, it was cats and rabbits and, and all sorts, which was a, a great thing for people, for their mental health and well-being. Um, also, it, people had the opportunity to spend more time with their yeah. families. What we're seeing now is a lot of people returning back to work, um, going back into the office, even with those hybrid um, you know, circumstances with work. And we're starting to see more pets now having to be left home alone. Right. And so what happens to the animals that, because some people are leaving them home alone and some people are then just taking them where? Dog shelters and saying, I can't cope with this anymore. Yes. Unfortunately, we are seeing an increase in the number of dogs being handed into rescues. Uh, it comes down to either they're not able to find someone to help them look after that animal or they're unable to find a solution or those animals are not coping very well without their families being at home. Yes. So, yes, it is becoming a, a bit more of a problem. What, what does that mean, not, not coping with their families not being at home? I've got a confession to make, Lorna. I can't do this interview anymore without being honest with you. <laughs> I'm scared of dogs. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'm scared of all dogs. Really? Yeah, I'm winging it, but I'm, I'm scared of all <laughs> dogs. Now, I've managed to raise three children who absolutely love dogs, and I don't understand where they get it from because it's certainly not their mother. <laughs> but I think that's because I wasn't brought up with any dogs. Yes, yes, very much so. What we do find is if you've been raised in an environment where there are animals around, you will typically grow up and you'll be an animal lover yourself. Yeah. If your family hasn't had them, um, again, you often are having to find a way to either families or friends who may have had cats or dogs that you get exposed to, but otherwise... Like yourself, you, you, may, you may not ever, you know, become one of those really strong animal lovers. So my kids obviously try and mither every single day. Mum, can we have a dog? Can we have a dog? Can we have a dog? But it is a huge responsibility, isn't it? Yes, it's a, it's a huge responsibility. And but I they, think this is where they people might, They might be watching, Lorna. So if you could just make this sound really, really bad, that'd be brilliant. <laughs> if you could do my work for me, tell, them, tell my kids what a big job it would be to have a dog. It is like raising another child. I've got enough of them. So I'm going to be really clear about that. It is a lot of responsibility. They are a living, breathing, sentient being. They have yeah. emotions and feelings. And they're going to be around for anything up to 15 years. So it is a big responsibility. It isn't something that you can just get and then pass off to a, a charity shop when you don't want it any longer, yeah. like a piece of clothing. And what about, like, the daily, like, the, the morning till night? What, what gives an idea of the responsibilities of the dog from the morning? When you wake up in the morning, you have to take them for a walk every day? Yes, uh, most dogs will require exercise outdoors uh, at least once a day, depending on the breed. Some mm -hmm. breeds are a bit lazier than others. Um, but typically, they will need a walk in the morning and a walk in the evening. You need to feed them. You need to obviously play with them, engage with them, keep them mentally stimulated. I think that is a big part of the responsibility that you have for their mental yeah. health and well-being. Well, happy Dog Day to everybody, Lorna. That's what yes. we've got to say, right? Yes, happy International Dog Day. Happy International Dog Day. Oh, in my house, honestly, the kids think it's International Dog Day every blimmin' day with the <laughs> and nagging, I get. Right, thank you very much for joining us. Now, we are going to go to uh, listen to the history um, of J James Cook. We were talking about it. So, um, Charles Forgan. Hello, Charles. Now, you are a member of the Captain James Cook Museum in Whitby. Yes, the Captain, so, the Captain Cook Memorial Museum in Whitby. 
perfect. I'm very happy to be corrected. Now, tell our viewers, particularly perhaps those younger ones, who Captain James Cook was and why he's important. Captain Cook uh, was a, an 18th century uh, e explorer, uh, the last of the great European explorers, uh, and he conducted three extraordinary voyages to the Pacific Ocean. If you go into our museum, you will find uh, two maps, uh, both of the 18th century. One of them is before Cook, and the other one is after Cook. The before Cook, the Pacific, is very largely a blank. There's very little charted. New Zealand is simply a squiggle. After Cook, virtually the whole map as we now know it is, is filled in. Uh, and that was the extent of his achievement, of the knowledge that he brought back to Europe after those voyages. There's a huge amount more of what he did and what the voyages achieved, but uh, that, that's probably the most, mo most obvious uh, and dramatic of the changes which he brought about. February, wasn't it, that um, the Australian archaeologists have tentatively identified a crumbling rock, uh, wreck off the coast of Rhode Island, which they say is HMS Endeavour. Do you, do you agree with that? And it's not in a, a great, well, it's clearly not in a great state of repair. It's been there a while, but it's being left to, to rot effectively. It's now getting damaged more than before. Am I right? Uh, not proven. Um, I'm by no means certain that the archaeologists have really got it right yet. They haven't proved it. And by now, honestly, I don't believe there's going to be very much left of any interest whatsoever. But I could be completely wrong. Well, I hope you are wrong. And, and he he's, remains a controversial uh, character, doesn't he, at the moment? There's a, an eight-metre-tall statue um, which is going to be moved from, Queen, from a Queensland street because it apparently stands in a, a Nazi salute. I'm not aware of that particular statue or that particular part of the controversy in Australia. I well, can't really I, comment. Now, of course, it was toppled. There was 24-hour guard at the Captain Cook statue. Um, this was in Whitby, as, as we said it in the, in the opening, in Yorkshire, because people had, had brought it down. They toppled it in an effort to, to rewrite history. Do, do you believe that we should be keeping these uh, statues there so that we can remember, Charles, the history of these people? I don't want to generalise. I think the Captain Cook statue should most certainly remain. Yeah, OK. Charles, thank you very much for educating me. Uh, Charles Forgan there, member of the uh, Captain James Cook Memorial Museum in Whitby. Now, keep... Uh, I think we're done, are we? Oh, that, was, that went quite quickly, didn't it? Um, thank you all for joining me and staying with me for this show this morning. I think I've got a week off next week, which is nice. Um, I hope you enjoy the last few days of August. It will soon be September. It always feels like the start of a new year, doesn't it, when you're a parent. Keep all your uh, views coming in. All the channels will be still wanting to hear from you for the rest of the day, especially the briefing with Alistair Stewart up next. Hello, Alex Deacon here with your latest weather updates. A uh, bank holiday for much of the UK and most places won't see much rain. It's going to be fine and bright with sunny spells. Some of the coasts, though, could turn quite windy, especially by Monday. The fine weather is being created by an area of high pressure moving in, but it's not with us just yet. This weather front today is bringing a few scattered showers across parts of the west, Wales and southwest Scotland in particular, seeing one or two heavy showers. The showers fading from Northern Ireland, dry and bright here and across northwest Scotland and for much of the Midlands and eastern parts of England, where we had quite a bit of rain yesterday. It's a much drier and brighter scene here with sunny spells. Still quite warm. It's not as humid as it was earlier in the week, but the temperatures getting into the 20s, maybe the mid 20s across the southeast. Cooler where we've got that weather from that line of cloud still providing a few showers into the evening. They'll tend to fade away. Most places will have a dry night. Could turn a bit misty once more. Some fog patches possible across East Anglia in the southeast. Not going to last too long into Saturday, but if you are getting away for the bank holiday early in the morning, that's just something to bear in mind. A fresher night, temperatures down into single figures across Scotland and Northern Ireland. 
On to the details for Saturday, and it's not going to be completely dry. There is the chance still of one or two showers, mostly over parts of northern England, but even further south, one or two are possible. But I say for the vast majority, it will stay dry. Clouding over across the north coast of Northern Ireland and the Western Isles of Scotland with a little rain here later on. Most places, though, dry, bright, sunny spells, probably a touch warmer than today, with temperatures high teens, low to mid 20s. Still, the odd shower here and there on Saturday evening. We will see a bit more rain just coming into the far northwest of Scotland. But again, most places staying dry on Saturday night, thanks to high pressure, which holds on onto Sunday. And again, many places dry and bright. As the high moves in, though, it will bring a cool breeze in the east coast and a brisk breeze on Monday on the south coast. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about.